Section 9 of Toto's Merry Winter by Laura E. Richards. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Jude Summers. Chapter 8 The Hermit. Bruin, what do you think? Oh, Bruin, what do you think? Thus spoke the little squirrel as he sat perched on his big friend's shoulder the day after the wedding. What do I think? repeated the bear. Why, I think that you are tickling my ear, Master Cracker, and that if you do not stop, I shall be under the painful necessity of knocking you off on the floor. Oh, that isn't the kind of thinking I mean, replied Cracker impudently, flipping the tip of his tail into the good bear's eye. That is of no consequence, you great big fellow. What are your ears for, if not for me to tickle? I mean, what do you think I heard at the party last night? A great deal of nonsense, replied the bear promptly. Bruin, I shall certainly be obliged to shake you, cried the squirrel. I shall shake you till your teeth rattle if you give me any more of this impudence. So behave yourself now and listen to me. I was talking with Chipper last night, my cousin, you know, who lives at the other end of the wood, and he told me something that really quite troubled me. You remember old Baldhead? Well, yes, said Bruin. I should say I did. He hasn't been in our part of the wood again, has he? Oh, no, replied Cracker. He is not likely to go anywhere for a long time, I should say. He has broken his leg, Chipper tells me, and has been shut up in his cavern for a week or more. Dear me, said the kind-hearted bear. I am very sorry to hear it. How does the poor old man get his food? Chipper didn't seem to think he could get any replied the squirrel. He peeped in at the door yesterday and saw him lying in his bunk, looking very pale and thin. He tried once or twice to get up, but fell back again. And Chipper is sure there was nothing to eat in the cave. I thought I wouldn't say anything to Coon or Toto last night, but would wait till I had told you. It must be seen to at once, cried Bruin, starting up. I will go myself and take care of the poor man till his leg is well. Where are the madam and Toto? We must tell them at once. The blind grandmother was in the kitchen, rolling out pie crust. She listened, with exclamations of pity and concern, to Cracker's account of the poor old hermit, and agreed with Bruin that aid must be sent to him without delay. I will pack a basket at once, she said, with nourishing food, bandages for the broken leg, and some simple medicines. And, Toto, you will take it to the poor man, will you not, dear? Of course I will, said Toto heartily. But Bruin said, No, dear madam, I will go myself. Our Toto's heart is big, but he is not strong enough to take care of a sick person. It is surely best for me to go. The grandmother hesitated. Dear Bruin, she said, Of course you would be the best nurse on many accounts. But if the man is weak and nervous, I am afraid you alarmed him once, you know, and possibly the sight of you coming in suddenly might— Speak out, Granny, cried Toto, laughing. You think Bruin will simply frighten the man to death, or at best into a fit, and you are quite right. I'll tell you what, old fellow, he added, turning to Bruin, who looked sadly crestfallen at this throwing of cold water on the fire of his kindly intentions. We will go together, and then the whole thing will be easily managed. I will go in first, and tell the hermit all about you, and then, when his mind is prepared, you can come in and make him comfortable. The good bear brightened up at this, and gladly assented to Toto's proposition, and the two set out shortly after, Bruin carrying a large basket of food, and Toto a small one, containing medicines and bandages. Part of the food was for their own lunch, as they had a long walk before them, and would not be back till long past dinner-time. They trudged briskly along, Toto whistling merrily as usual, but his companion very grave and silent. "'What ails you, old fellow?' asked the boy, when a couple of miles had been traversed in this manner. "'Has our account of the wedding made you pine with envy and wish yourself a mouse?' "'No,' replied the bear slowly. "'Oh, no!' I should not like to be a mouse or anything of that sort. But I do wish, Toto, that I was not so frightfully ugly. 
ugly cried toto indignantly who said you were ugly what put such an idea into your head why you yourself said the bear sadly you said i would frighten the man to death or into a fit now one must be horribly ugly to do that you know my dear bruin cried toto it isn't because you are ugly why you are a perfect beauty for a bear but well you are very large you know and somewhat shaggy if you don't mind my saying so and you must remember that most bears are very savage disagreeable creatures how is anybody who sees you for the first time to know that you are the best and dearest old fellow in the world besides he added have you forgotten how you frightened this very hermit when he stole your honey last year bruin hung his head and looked very sheepish i wouldn't roar now of course he said i meant to be very gentle and just put one paw in and then the end of my nose and so get into the cave by degrees you know toto had his doubt as to the soothing effect which would have been produced by this singular measure but he had not the heart to say so and after a pause bruin continued of course however you and madam were quite right quite right you were my boy but i was wondering just now whether there were not some way of making myself less frightful now you and madam have no hair on your faces none anywhere in fact except a very little on the top of your head that gives you a gentle expression you see do you think would it be possible would you advise me to to in fact to shave the hair off my face the excellent bear looked wistfully at toto to mark the effect of this proposition but toto after struggling for some moments to preserve his gravity burst into a peal of laughter so loud and clear that it woke the echoes of the forest <laughs> laughed the boy oh 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 dear me oh oh bruin you really must excuse me but i cannot help it oh <laughs> bruin looked hurt and vexed for a moment but it was only a moment toto's laughter was too contagious to be resisted the worthy bear's features relaxed and the next instant he was laughing himself or coming as near to it as a black bear can oh i am a foolish old fellow i suppose he said we will say no more about it toto but hark who is that speaking it sounded like a crow only it was too feeble they listened and presently the sound was heard again and this time it certainly was a faint but distinct and apparently at no great distance from them the two companions looked about and soon saw the owner of the voice perched on a stump and croaking dismally a more miserable looking bird was never seen his feathers drooped in limp disorder and evidently had not been trimmed for days his eyes were half shut and save when he opened his beak to utter a despairing ah he might have been mistaken for a stuffed bird and a badly stuffed bird at that hello friend shouted toto in his cheery voice what is the matter that makes you look so down in the beak the crow raised his head and looked sadly at the two strangers i am sick he said and i can't get anything to eat for myself or my master who is your master asked the boy he is a hermit replied the crow he lives in a cave nearby but last week he broke his leg and has not been able to move since then he has nothing to eat for he will not touch raw snails and i cannot find anything else for him i fear he will die soon and i shall probably die too come come said the bear don't let me hear any nonsense of that kind die indeed here take that sir and don't talk foolishness that was neither more nor less than the wing of a roast chicken which bruin had pulled hastily from the basket the famished crow fell upon it beak and claw without more ado and a silence ensued while the two friends well pleased watched the first effect of their charitable mission poor creature said toto were you ever so hungry as that bruin 
"'Oh, yes,' said the bear carelessly. "'Often and often. "'When I come out in the spring, you know. "'But I never stayed hungry for long,' he added, with a significant grimace. "'This crow is sick, you see, and probably cannot help himself much. "'How does that go, old fellow?' he said, addressing the crow, "'who had polished the chicken bone till it shone again, "'and now looked up with a twinkle in his eye, "'very different from the wretched, lackluster expression they had at first worn. "'You have given me life, sir,' he said warmly. "'You have positively given me life. "'I am once more a crow. "'And now tell me how I can serve you, "'for you are evidently bent on some errand.' "'We have come to see your master,' said Toto. "'We heard of his accident and thought he must be in need of help. "'So if you will show us the way—' The crow needed no more, but joyfully spread his wings and half-hopped, half-fluttered along the ground as fast as he could go. "'Noble strangers!' he cried. "'Our humble dwelling is close at hand. Follow me, I pray, and blessings attend your footsteps!' The two friends followed, and soon came upon the entrance to a cave, around which a sort of rustic porch had been built. Vines were trained over it, and a rude chair and table stood beneath the pleasant shade. "'This is my master's study,' said the crow. "'Here we have spent many happy and profitable hours. May it please you to enter, worshipful sirs.' "'What do you say, Bruin?' asked Toto, glancing at his companion. "'Shall we go in, or send the crow first to announce us?' "'You had better go in alone,' said the bear decidedly. I will stay here with Master Crow, and when, that is, if you decide it is best for me to come in later, you have but to call me. Accordingly, Toto entered the cavern, which was dimly lighted by a hole in the roof. As soon as his eyes became accustomed to the gloom, he perceived a rude pallet at one side, on which was stretched the form of a tall old man. His long white hair and beard were matted and tangled. His thin hands lay helpless by his side. It seemed as if he were scarcely alive. He opened his eyes, however, at the sound of footsteps, and looked half fearfully at the boy, who bent softly over him. "'Good morning, sir,' said Toto, not knowing what else to say. "'Is your leg better to-day?' "'Water,' murmured the old man feebly. "'Water? Why, yes, of course. I'll get some in a minute.' He started for the mouth of the cave, but before he reached it, a huge shaggy black paw was thrust in at the aperture, holding out a bark dish, while a sort of enormous whisper, which just was not a growl, murmured, "'Here it is.' "'Thank you, Bru—' "'I mean, thank you,' said Toto, in some confusion, glancing apprehensively towards the bed. But the old man noticed nothing, till the clear, cold water was held to his lips." He drank eagerly, and seemed to gain a little strength at once, for he now gazed earnestly at Toto, and presently said, in a feeble voice, "'Who are you, dear child, and what good angel has sent you to save my life?' "'My name is Toto,' replied the boy. "'As to how I came here, I will tell you all that by and by. But now you are too weak either to talk or to listen, and I must see at once about getting you some—' food came the huge whisper again rolling like a distant muttering of thunder through the cavern and again the shaggy paw appeared solemnly waving a bowl of jelly toto flew to take it but paused for a moment overcome with amusement at the aspect presented by his friend the good bear had wedged his huge bulk tightly into a corner behind a jutting fragment of rock here he sat with the basket of provisions between his knees, and an air of deep and solemn mystery in his look and bearing. Not seeing Toto, he still held the bowl of jelly in his outstretched paw, and opening his cavernous jaws, was about to send out another rolling thunder-whisper of food, when Toto sprang quickly on the jelly, and taking a spoon from the basket, wrapped the bear on the nose with it, and then returned to his charge. The poor hermit submitted meekly to being fed with a spoon, and at every mouthful seemed to gain strength. A faint color stole into his wan cheek, his eyes brightened, 
and before the bowl was two-thirds empty, he actually smiled. "'I little thought I should ever taste jelly again,' he said. "'Indeed, I had fully made up my mind that I must starve to death here, for I was unable to move, and never thought of human aid coming to me in this lonely spot. Even my poor crow, my faithful companion for many years, has left me. I trust he has found some other shelter, for he was feeble and lame himself. Oh, he's all right, said Toto cheerily. It was he who showed us the way here, and he's outside now, talking to, that is, talking to himself, you know. Showed us the way, repeated the hermit. You have a companion, then. Why does he not come in, and let me thank him also for his kindness? He, said Toto, stammering, he, oh, he, he doesn't like to be thanked. But at least he will come in, urged the old man. Do, pray ask him. I am distressed to think of him staying outside. Is he a very shy boy? He isn't a boy, said Toto. He's, oh, what a muddle I'm making of it. He, he's bigger than a boy, sir, a great deal bigger. And, I, I hope you don't mind, but he's black. A negro? "'Is it possible?' exclaimed the hermit. "'My dear boy, I have no prejudice against the Ethiopian race. "'I must insist on his coming in. "'Stay, I will call him myself. "'I believe they are generally called either Caesar or Pompey. "'Mr. Pomp—' "'Oh, stop!' cried Toto in distress. "'His name isn't Pompey, it's Bruin. "'And he wouldn't come in yet if I were to—' "'Cut him into inch pieces!' came rolling like muffled thunder through the doorway. The old hermit started as if he had been shot. Ah, what is that? he cried. Boy, boy, who, what is that speaking? Oh, dear, cried Toto distractedly. Oh, dear, what shall I do? Please don't be alarmed, Mr. Baldhead. I mean, Mr. Hermit. He is the best, dearest, kindest old fellow in the world, and it isn't his fault because he was... "'Born so!' resounded from without, and the poor hermit, now speechless with terror, could only gasp and gaze at Toto with eyes of agonized entreaty. "'Yes, he was born so,' continued the boy, "'and we might have been bears ourselves, you know, if we had happened to have them for fathers and mothers, so—' But here he paused in dismay, for the hermit, without more ado, quietly fainted away. "'Oh, Bruin! Crow! Come here!' cried Toto. "'I'm afraid he is dead or dying. What shall we do?' At this summons the crow came hopping and fluttering in, followed by the unhappy bear, who skulked along, hugging the wall and making himself as small as possible, while he cast shamefaced and apologetic glances toward the bed. "'Oh, you needn't mind now,' cried Toto. "'He won't know you are here. Do you think he is dead, Crow?' Have you ever seen him like this before? But the crow never had, and the three of them were standing beside the bed in mute dismay, when suddenly a light flutter of wings was heard, and a soft voice cooed, Toto, Bruin, and the next moment Pigeon Pretty came flying into the cave, with a bunch of dried leaves in her bill. A glance showed her the situation, and alighting softly on the old man's breast, she held the leaves to his nostrils fanning him the while with her outspread wings. Oh, she said, I have flown so fast I am quite out of breath. You see, dears, I was afraid that something of this sort might happen, as soon as I heard of your going. I was in the barn, you know, when you were talking about it and getting ready. So I flew to my old nest and got these leaves, of which I always keep a store on hand. See, he is beginning to revive already. In truth, the pungent fragrance of the leaves, which now filled the air, seemed to have had a magical effect on the sick man. His eyelids fluttered, his lips moved, and he muttered faintly, "'The bear! Oh, the bear!' The wood pigeon motioned to Bruin and Toto to withdraw, which they speedily did, casting remorseful glances at one another. Silently and sadly they sat down in the porch, and here, Poor Bruin abandoned himself to despair, 
clutching his shaggy hair, and even pulling out several handfuls of it, while he inwardly called himself by every hard name he could think of. Toto sat looking gloomily at his boots for a long time, but finally he said in a whisper, "'Cheer up, old fellow. It was all my fault. I do suppose I am the stupidest boy that ever lived. If I had only managed a little better... Hark! What is that?' Both listened, and heard the soft voice of the wood-pigeon calling, "'Bruin! Bruin! Toto! Come in, both of you. Mr. Hermit understands all about it now, and is ready to welcome both his visitors.' Much amazed, the two friends rose and slowly and hesitatingly re-entered the cave, the bear making more desperate efforts even than before to conceal his colossal bulk. To his astonishment, however, the hermit, who was now lying propped up by an improvised pillow of dry moss, greeted him with an unflinching gaze, and even smiled and held out his hand. "'Mr. Bruin,' he said, I am glad to meet you, sir. This sweet bird has told me all about you, and I am sincerely pleased to make your acquaintance. So you have walked ten miles and more to bring help and comfort to an old man who stole your honey? But this was more than the good bear could stand. He sat down on the ground, and thrusting his great shaggy paws into his eyes, fairly began to blubber. At this, I am ashamed to say, all the others fell to laughing. First Toto laughed, but Toto, bless him, was always laughing. Then Pigeon Pretty laughed, and then Jim Crow, and then the Hermit, and finally Bruin himself. And so they all laughed together, till the forest echoes rang, and the woodchucks almost stirred in their holes. End of Section 9